I learned a great deal from your book about Royce, is we, uh, reimagining pragmatism, and from problems of Christianity and from your, your talk. Uh, when I read the book, I, the treatment of atonement was, problem of Christianity was the one thing that I thought was a terrible stumbling block because <laughs> I liked the treatment of purse. I liked some of the other ideas he developed, but to the extent that he seems to be saying that atonement can be generalized out of Christianity and made an idea of the higher religions, I found it unpersuasive, just as some people see that Kant or other categories don't really cover every situation. I don't really see atonement in the sense you explained it as being an idea either in Buddhism or in Judaism, I don't see the Joseph story as being read that way by the Jewish tradition as being atonement. Or, to take a Christian example, um, Elaine Pagels, who teaches here in her book on uh, the Judas Gospel, which, of course, is uh, not part of the standard gospel, but she reads that as taking issue with the, what developed as the Orthodox Christian view of atonement and is showing that there was part very early in the early history of Christianity that, that rejected that as an idea. And so I don't really see the atonement idea as being central to the development of religion, as Royce seems to say in the book. Good. Thank you very much. And I just want to share with you that I, too, have had a great deal found that chapter 6 and parts of chapter 7 on atonement very difficult. I probably read the book and tried to study it, you know, 20, 30 times. And it's only been more recently that I began to see what Royce was trying to do there. Uh, he himself says the idea of atonement is by far the most difficult for all people to understand. And they try to understand religion, especially the religion of Christianity. Uh, he says, community idea is hard. It imposes upon us certain responsibilities and requires sensitivity to the other members of the community. The idea of the moral burden is not, my, it's not light. It's not easy nor pleasant to look at my own sins and faults. Okay? But when you come to the idea of atonement, you know, you're asking the $64 question. Uh, is there a peak of heroism in religious life? Can loving loyalty go so far that it does a deed and tries to invent something to offset the evil that has somebody else has brought? So the fundamental, minimal idea of atonement that Royce is talking about is triad, namely this treacherous deed, and then the, the traitor can't, get, can't do anything to get himself out of that mess. Is there something else that the community can do or invent. So the community is the second member of the triad. And then you have grace or logo, the, the logos interpreter, the interpreter spirit coming down and giving the light so this man invents a way of offsetting, let's say, of treating those brothers coming down for the grain. What am I going to demand of them? I'm certainly not just going to embrace them right off. There has to be a period of time and that's my interpreting spirit, which effects the reunion of the family. Now, I don't, I don't think I, that whole business of to what extent in Jewish, Judaism or Buddhism you will find this, you know, this um, minimal idea of, uh, of atonement present. That's, you know, down the road, all the research that I would like to do and many others would like to do. But it's, it's an interesting hypothesis. Is that true that you can generalize? And I think that would be a question James would love to, to approach. I'm sorry to talk so much. That's good. Uh, I wonder if you could say some more about uh, the matter of the world being a better place after uh, the the atonement for the sin. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. I, I wonder how we could ever really know that. I, I acknowledge with you that there is a gain in the atonement, but the gain follows a loss. 
a, fr a fracture. And, and in fact, the, the sinner and the, the community that has been sinned against, particularly with the case of the traitor, uh, forever dwell in the hell of the irrevocable, as Rice puts it, I think, in the world and the individual. Yeah. Uh, so I just sort of wonder how, how we can be assured that things really are better uh, a after the sin and after the atonement than they would have been had the sin never taken place. Yeah. Your question, I think, presupposes that it's for us to see. Uh, and he has a line in there that part of the objection is either this atonement, say, by, the, by Joseph, and that's a petty affair, something back, uh, what, uh, 3,000 years ago, how many people remember some aid to the Pharaoh helping out various people distributing geranium? So, so it's petty, it seems to be, or it's beyond our vision, you know. But the, he says, look at the objective fact. Has there been placed into the role of the stream of human history some event whereby that particular treason is given a totally new meaning? Because Christ, if, uh, if Adam hadn't sinned, Christ wouldn't have come, at least according to some theologians. And the, the, it's, it, I don't know if you're familiar with the famous, famous antiphon at the uh, Easter rite where you say, Oh, Felix Culpa, how, it's, a, it's a happy fault that Adam committed because what it has done, it has called forth the coming of so magnificent a Savior. And that's what gives the human history its glowing hope and the triumph of the Spirit through Christ's resurrection and his sending of the Spirit. Now, I don't know if does that, does that help you see it? That there is a way that who, who in this room or who in the world, what a human being, has ever really un, unmasked the mystery of atonement? Or, you know, atonement can be translated redemption. Um, there are about 11 different words mm. that try to get onto this thing. But atonement and uh, reconciliation are the two favorites of Royce. I think Catholics talk about redemption. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you spoke, maybe this was in the end of your talk that you didn't get to, but you were saying that somehow this comes together uh, in light of James's science of religions. And, and I want to see, of course, for James, as you pointed, pointed out, Royce no, didn't. I, I, I say it in the sense of a hypothesis. Oh, well, yeah. to push the hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, for James, of course, the science of religions led him to notions of the subconscious uh, and so on. This what the overflow and what's beyond. Uh, that's one thing. And but but there's ties there because, of course, Royce is involved in psychical research. And that would have been the science, uh, one of the f sources of the science that led in. So it's kind of an open question of where psychical research, Royce's participation may fit into this. And also this, to me, somewhat mysterious thing is uh, why uh, Royce spent so much time with psychology. And it, it, it ought to fig figure in if he's, uh, uh, you know, interested in trying to understand atonement reconciliation. Uh, it's kind of an open question to ask if you can tie psychology and, and psychical research into, into the story you're telling. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's good. I mean, if you go back into the files and you find that Royce was conducting psychological experiences, experiments in, in the Harvard labs and so forth. Uh, and there's a lot of psychology in Royce. Um, I, I think the reason that, that quote about the telephone company, you know, and his mm. kind of abhorrence where uh, maybe things are going to surprise us. They bubble up from the unconscious, you know, and he can't get control. I think the ra Royce is some kind of rationalist. And a rationalist has to have, like, control of his, his matter. But this is, you know, surprising. He hasn't got control if this stuff is coming up from the subconscious. You see, and I think at first Royce is quite opposed to that, but as the 10 or 14 years go by, up to his death, Royce is a lot more open and flexible, uh, and his, his, his metaphysics and the uh, anthropology becomes uh, quite more pro process-based, and that's due to Peirce, of course, very heavily. So um, I think he, 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 he wanted the divine impulses to be kind of objectively seen or felt by us. In, at the conscious level. 
And there we would have our science. But I think James may have been more acute there and seen that, that, the, that the subconscious has a great influence mm. on us. Maybe one or two more questions. Let's go here and then over to the side. Start there. Yeah, right there. Yeah? Um, I wonder if it's true that this um, experience um, of atonement is so universal because it's a very um, specific kind of religion who is prominent since Jonathan Edwards. Um, it had must, much to do this focus of conversion, and um, this is the same point in, in James' theory of religion. It's difficult to transfer this of all kind of religion. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it does seem rather crazy to uh, do this case study on religions of which this business of atonement is just a part and where he's doing this analysis. I, you, I should have mentioned that, and I did, well, I did mention it briefly, that the sources is his general philosophy of religions. That he did that in 1912, and then in 1913, he fulfilled the promise to apply those principles that he had gotten in the sources to the problem of Christianity. But, you know, uh, the whole idea of interreligious dialogue, intercultural dialogue, um, that is a hundred years later in coming, you know. We are at that point where it becomes a crucial question. Um, uh, can you come to an idea of religion just at the general level, or in some sense, do you need to go down to some case studies of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Christianity, Ju Judaism, and so forth, um, to come up to a, a, a central idea? Now, Dewey, of course, said you can't do it. You know, uh, any kind of a common idea. But I think James wanted to have uh, uh, the, the common things that we find through case studies Put those together at the, at the end of the varieties, remember? And he found, felt that we could get at least some common things that would be found in every religion. That means they're going to be stripped of a lot of their uh, uh, ritual, of their uh, formulas, their songs. Uh, and he, Royce is the first one. Well, he shocked people by saying, if you look forward to Christianity from 1913 to 2013 or 2113, the forms are going to be very, very different. Christianity is going to be transformed through the time and the purifying process of in, in meeting the world cultures. Take one last question, Betty. Betty, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's interesting that uh, Roy should get his idea, or be inspired, of his idea of atonement from Bach, St. Matthew Passion. I remember that um, Mendelssohn revised, uh, revived the work in the 1820s, and Hegel attended the performance. And we'll never know what Hegel thought of it. But Yaroslav Pelikan wrote a book a few years ago entitled Bach Among the Theologians. And in that, that book, Pelikan says that the whole of the St. Matthew Passion is Bach's commentary, musically, of the Christian doctrine of atonement. Of the atonement. Of atonement. The whole work is a study of that. And the complementary work, the St. John Passion, the theme there is not so much the sacrificial lamb, but rather Christ the victor over evil. So I think it's very interesting that, uh, that uh, Royce would get his clue from a work where Bach was explicitly working out in musical terms the theory of the atonement. Yeah. So I thought I would, I would mention it, that. It also, it also shows you how much Royce in his uh, later thinking especially is not just head, but heart and soul and the whole integral human body has to be affected by a thing like this music and drama that he's, he's, he's participating in. You see, so so uh, Royce is, I think, very unfortunately, been presented as part an egghead. And I think that's, <laughs> that's very unfair. At Please. Least especially of the leader Royce. Yeah. 
we uh, no doubt could continue, but indeed I think we should continue over drinks and dinner. Right. Please join me in thanking Frank Oppenheim. <laughs> <laughs>